Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. God is good. You can turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 11. We are just moving along here in the book of Acts. Funny story, when we were at the pastor's summit uh, in Erie, Pennsylvania, I traveled eight hours. That was fun. <laughs> Sense the sarcasm. But it was, it was worth it. It was a great time, uh, four days with other pastors, and God moved and encouraged us. But what's interesting is our superintendent, he preached on Tuesday, mor uh, yeah, Tuesday morning, and he says, turn to Acts eleven nineteen. And I said, well, all right, I'm going to take your sermon because that's where we're at today. You know, <laughs> thank the Lord I had time uh, last week to work on my message. So uh, I just got some extra notes from our superintendent, Don Immel. But I went up to him. I said, thank you for preaching and studying for my sermon on Sunday. What's the chances of us having the same scripture? You know, I thought that was interesting. So Pastor Kuhn, I believe, coined this phrase the world at its worst needs the church at its best. And I, I might be wrong on that, but I, I heard him say it so much. I, I was like, it must be Pastor Kuhn that said that. And in our story today, our scripture today, we're going to see the church at its best and ministering and changing a community. And we're also going to see that this community is where we first got our names Christian. So it's going to be interesting. And we're also going to see prophecy. But I am hopeful right now in our world. I know there's a lot going on and there's a lot of things that you can say, wow, this is a crazy world we live in. But at the same time, the church of Jesus Christ is alive and well. Can I get an amen? amen. God is moving. And let me tell you, the resurgence that you have seen here, uh, not just in attendance, but also just hunger for God, is happening in the entire Pendel district. Sure, there are some churches who are struggling here and there, but right now churches are growing by the hundreds, maybe even thousands in Pennsylvania, Delaware. And so God is on the move, yeah. So be encouraged today, and, I, and I'm seeing a hunger for more of God in this place and in our church. I'm seeing a hunger to serve God more, and I just wanna encourage you, keep chasing after God. He's not far. He's right next to you. He's there. Keep pursuing him. Uh, he is moving and working in this church and in other churches. We're not the only church that's experiencing the presence of the Lord. Uh, Acts 11 verse 19 says, meanwhile, the believers who have been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of, those, of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. If you remember, when Stephen was stoned to death, his stoning actually didn't do a silencing effect, it did a multiplying effect. What the enemy thought would cause harm, God did for our good. God sent the church out, believers out to, this, this, is, this place in particular, Antioch, is 300 miles away from Jerusalem. And so believers scattered across the region into Gentile lands, or well, and their land too, but where all the Gentiles were primarily because of Rome's domination of that area. And so Jews went to this region preaching right away to Jews first, but then some believers started preaching to Gentiles. And this would be not normal. As we learned last week, even Peter was struggling to even have fellowship with Gentiles until God fixed his thinking on that in our story last time. If you recall, last week we learned about the Gentile Pentecost how the Holy Spirit came upon the Gentiles, not just the Jews, and a Gentile is anyone who is not a Jew. All right, simple as that. So all of us primarily, mainly are Gentiles in this room, unless you have Jewish blood in you. So imagine then the, the Holy Spirit pouring out over them when they believed, and now the door has been opened to Gentiles, 
But even before that story, it's believed that believers left that stoning of Stephen and preached to Gentiles too. And what we see here is a great number of them were saved in Antioch. Antioch is important. It was the third largest city uh, for Rome. And uh, it's in the Asian Minor Territory. So if, if people are getting saved in Antioch, then the Lord can spread throughout the Gentile nations. You following uh, the scripture on that? So now the Holy Spirit is using the church in the Gentile land. And here's what's uh, just really powerful to me is it was done by everyday believers, not the church leadership. This scripture says believers went, not the apostles. So church, let me encourage you. You don't need to be a pastor with a platform to make a difference in this community. In fact, I need you as much as you need me to make a difference in this community. Can I get an amen on that too? And I believe that God working through you through the power of the Holy Spirit, that you could lead a revival in your workplace, in your neighborhood, and in this community. And I'm praying for that. And I believe we're on the way with God's help. Verse 22 says, when the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a man, a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. When Jerusalem heard this, they just, you know, they just wanted to verify, and then they sent their greatest encourager, they sent Barnabas. He stayed with them to encourage them to build up their faith, and he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and so he came alongside them to help them grow. Church, just so you know, behind the scenes, this is what I'm working on. I'm working on equipping our church through small groups, through discipleship, through training that's coming up here in this next season. I'm, I'm hoping and praying that by September, there's gonna be some training for all of us who are hungry to help other people follow Jesus. And I'm, I'm ready to do an all church training if needed to help us come alongside believers like a Barnabas but I wanna encourage you not to wait to a training, but let the Holy Spirit train you now. Let the Holy Spirit use you now. The Holy Spirit can fill you and help you and lead you to be a Barnabas in people's lives. We need, the church needs to be like a Barnabas, and I believe God is raising up Barnabases in this place right now. And if there's a female one, and maybe it's Barbara, okay? All right. That he's raising up Barbaras and Barnabases to come alongside new believers and help them follow Jesus. Can I get an amen for that as well? Do not look down on yourself as incapable of coming alongside someone and encouraging them to know how to read the Bible or teaching them how to pray or answering questions or even admitting you don't know the answer to that question. That's okay. It's amazing that when you become like a Barbara or Barnabas in someone's life, you actually grow a lot because it pushes you to learn and to study and to read the word. It holds you accountable that if you're gonna help someone else read the word, you should be reading the word too, amen? Barnabas came in and he, he was blown away by the, by the faith of these Gentiles and so he does something next that I find pretty interesting and it brings us to our next Scripture, verse 25, then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. So he traveled 300 miles to go to Antioch. And when he gets there, he's blown away. And so he, he's saying, I need some help. There is so much growth here. I need help. And so he goes to find Tarsus or goes to find uh, Saul in Tarsus, which is 100 miles away. And when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch and both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. Isn't that good? They spent a whole year teaching people, large crowds. And it was at Antioch, this is where Luke gives us like this bracket. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Makes you wonder what they saw. 
I'm gonna address this in the end of my message. But we need Barnabases and we need Saul's. Yes, the discipleship made the impact, but we all know it was the light of Jesus Christ shining through these apostles and the believers are already there that made the greatest impact, amen? God wants to use you, but let me tell you something. We are quote unquote usable or utilized and empowered because of the power of Jesus Christ living in us. Jesus should get all the glory for the growth of this church. It's Jesus working through submitted believers, people who are empowered by the Holy Spirit to do this work. And so you alone can't do this kind of work where you're helping people for a whole year. You're gonna need the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why the scripture was careful here to say that Barnabas was a good man and strong in the faith and full of the Holy Spirit. We need men and women, young men and women, we even need kids to be strong in the faith, full of the Holy Spirit, and even be willing to say, I need help, let me go get someone else to help me. Let's do this, but two by two, Jesus sent them out. Barnabas was so wise to go get some help. And it's where, this is where Saul got even more hands-on training. Remember, he was newly converted not too long before this. And so he needed some help, some guidance on how to, how to make disciples and how to help other people. And so Barnabas brought him in and said, let's do this together. So Barnabas was like a, a, an encourager and a father to Saul who would go on to write 13 books of the New Testament. Who knows what might happen today if you bring in another believer and help them by them helping you. It's discipleship multiplication right in front of us in this scripture. So let's keep going. And uh, I wanna come back to, they were, we were first called Christians here in Antioch. By the way, there's only three places in scripture where we were called Christians. The other one's in Acts and the other one's in 1 Peter. But verse 27 says this, during this time, some prophets traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up in one of the meetings and predicted by the spirit that a great famine was coming upon the entire Roman world. This was fulfilled during the reign of Claudius. By the way, um, Roman and Jewish historians who were not Christians record this event and they believe it happened around AD 46 at the height of a, of a famine and that the, this word came true in that time. So it wasn't just Christians who recorded that. Verse 29, so the believers in Antioch, because of this famine, decided to send relief to their brothers and sisters in Judea, everyone giving as much as they could. This they did, entrusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul to take to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. The famine had hit Judea so hard. And I, here's, what I, here's what I love about this. You know, God is a sovereign God looking out for everyone's well-being. And he'll work years in advance to help, okay? God saved a very wealthy city, okay? Christians, people were becoming Christians there in a very wealthy area to take care of the entire church in Judea. Do you think God can do that too? Do you think that God not only just saved them for most of all, primarily for their salvation to have eternal life, but what if God also had a plan to take care of his people, all who believe in him in Judea by saving places where they were wealthy and were able to give great gifts? And here you have it years later, Paul and Barnabas bring a gift to take care of his people. That is God's providence and sovereign hand. God cares about you. He is working out your provision. And we see here the generosity of the church. We see here where people's gifts came together to help those in need. And that's a mark of true Christianity and the church. Prophecy primarily is in two ways in the New Testament. It's foretelling and foretelling. Agabus had a very uh, specific prophetic prediction. Wow, I'll try to say that three times fast. And he predicted that there would be a great famine. And sure enough, there was. 
just a, uh, just a few years later, according to our timing and dating. And so what we are calling this, or what we do see this as, is foretelling. So foretelling prophecy is speaking for God and speaking forth what God wants us to hear. So sometimes you hear that in our services where someone has a word from the Lord, that's foretelling. But foretelling can be a specific prediction that something's going to happen. I haven't heard many of those in churches recently, but they are coming. And we will hear more specific things in the times that we're living in. Do you follow me? And so we need to keep our ears attuned. And we also, as spirit-filled believers, need to be attuned to the Holy Spirit because God might be speaking to us. Now, personally, I haven't had any foretelling predictions, but God has given me words for the church over the years, even before I became a lead pastor, and I would share them with my father as the lead pastor. And we would take those and pray over them and seek the Lord on those as well. And if needed, we bring that before the whole church. God is speaking to his church. And the reason why Luke highlights this is because Agabus visited Antioch, so he's focusing on Christianity and Antioch. But I believe that in this church too, God wants to speak to us to give us foretelling or foretelling things. But of course, we do it in the fear of the Lord, amen? We make sure that uh, we have sought the Lord on that. It's not just uh, what we think. It's not driven by our views of something or our agenda, but it's totally led by the Holy Spirit. We want authentic words from the Lord. So let's talk about Christianity because this is where they first called the church, the believers, Christian. What is a Christian? It is important that we make a distinction of what it means to be a Christian. Unfortunately, it is those who profess to be Christian who have watered down the meaning. However, true Christians do face false expectations from misunderstanding of Christianity and false accusations due to poor examples. And this is not right, nor is it fair that we face these things, but it is reality. Personally, I have been trying to paint Christianity in its truest form as best as I can because uh, I'm not Jesus, so I can't do it perfectly. Can I get an amen on that? And neither are you. So we want to do our best to paint Christianity in its truest form, but we're not Jesus. And I do, I do want to say this, that we should not criticize the Christian faith based on the people, but on the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus can't be criticized. He's perfect. I mean, if you want to test him, uh, surely you can look at his track record in scripture and you will find that he's a perfect man. And so we should judge the Christian faith based on the center figure, not the people who have been saved by it. But the world does judge us and looks at us. And we're trying to be Christians in the true sense of the word, and we're constantly walking on this balance beam with little room for error. Have you ever walked on a balance beam? Anyone ever walk on the tallest one? I did. Back in the day, we used to have one here. It's kind of funny because they don't have those in schools anymore. You know, it's like too dangerous, I guess. I mean, we, used to, we used to try to do cartwheels on those things. <laughs> My goodness. Splinters, yes, we did get those. I would say, though, that this balance beam kind of walk that we had to have isn't really all that bad of a situation. Because narrow is the road and narrow is the gate to eternal life with God. So we do need to walk this fine line because it's already narrow anyway. You know, the, <laughs> wide is the gate to hell, but narrow is the way to heaven, scriptures teach, teaches us. And so I don't think it's all that bad that we do our best to represent Jesus in his truest form as much as possible even though we won't ever do that perfectly. 
We should be careful to know what it means and looks like to be a Christian. And one of my life verses that I live by is 1 John 2, 6. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. That's a tough one, isn't it? So those who say they're Christians, those who say they're believers and followers of Jesus Christ, they should live their lives as Jesus did. Let me clarify something for us all real quick. The word Christian came from Antioch because basically what the Greeks and the Romans did back at that time is they put um, the word Iani on the end of dedicated followers. So if Pompey had a following, they called them Pompeianis, okay? Um, so when they saw Christ, they, they called them Christianis. And in English, it's Christian. And what they saw was an alliance or an allegiance, a dedicated following of Christ. So when they called us Christians, they were saying they were followers of Christ. Now, why was this important? Because I know the word Christian's gotten a bad rap, but it is important for that time, and here's why. Because they were Jews. Many of them were Jews, and so what do you call them? They're not, they're, not Jude, uh, they're not part of Judaism anymore. They're Christians. All who believed in Jesus Christ were not practicing Judaism, so they couldn't call them Jews. And they didn't want to call them Jewish believers now because they were Gentile believers. This is important. So what do you call a believer who's Gentile? You can't call them Jewish believers of Christ. That wouldn't make sense. So they called them Christians which means to be just like Christ, to be part of his following. And so I just wanna just ease any anxiety towards, uh, for you. If you feel like it's you know, not a good idea to call yourself Christian, what they were saying then is you are a follower or believer of Jesus Christ. That was what it meant in its truest form at that time. And it was important because they were Gentiles, they weren't Jews, so they needed to make a distinction. But today, I want to clarify and make some more distinctions. There are those who wear crosses around their neck. This doesn't make you a Christian. There are those who have been born and raised in a Christian family. This doesn't make you a Christian. We call that secondhand faith, but you need to have firsthand faith. You need to have a firsthand experience with Jesus. There are those who believe in God and country, but being American doesn't make you a Christian. There are those who oppose the culture of immorality and lawlessness. In other words, they're moralists. They believe in people living good and not being lawless, but that doesn't make you a Christian. There are those who attend church occasionally, maybe two times a year. They do good deeds. They try not to sin and pray at night, but this doesn't make you a Christian either. Do you know that? Isn't that, isn't that interesting? That doesn't make you a Christian. That's religion. You can practice religion. I'm going to go a little step further, okay? And you have to understand, I'm a pastor, so I've seen it all, okay? But I'm still young, so I'm still learning, and I'm seeing new views and different things. I have room to improve on this view. But there are those who attend church, even begin to serve and do things their church does, but this doesn't make you a Christian. I remember sitting down with someone in this church. They were part of the choir a long time ago. And they said that their salvation experience was being part of the choir. And when I heard that, we had to have a conversation because we're not saved by being on the choir. We're not say, I'm not saved by being up here preaching. You're not saved by serving in the parking lot. Thank God for our parking lot team, by the way. Because <laughs> apparently we're, we're running out of parking spaces. So uh, if you can carpool to, to church together, that'd be great, but I get it. If you have errands to run after church, it makes total sense. So, or if you come at different times, but thank God for them. So listen, I, I'm not trying to be judgmental here. I'm just trying to make sure that we understand what a true Christian is. A true Christian professes faith in Christ as Lord and son of God and conforms to the thinking and ways of Christ. So a true Christian not only professes their faith that Jesus is Lord and the Son of God, 
but their life begins to look like it. Again, my scripture that I live by, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. And this all happens spiritually, organically, and intentionally because Christ lives in believers and we must cooperate with the Holy Spirit in Christ living in us. It happens spiritually and organically because when you believe in Jesus Christ, you are born again of the Spirit. So his Holy Spirit comes in you to give you the ability to live holy for Christ and for God and to live just like Jesus. Not perfect like Jesus, but to live like him, okay? To resemble him and to imitate his, his ways, to conform to his ways. So number one, you know you're a true Christian if you profess faith in Christ. Here's our scripture, Romans 10:9. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We have to declare that Jesus is Lord. 1 John 2, 23 through 24. By the way, why is that important? Because uh, people who do not confess Jesus as the Son of God and they don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, they do not believe in the Christian faith. And those are important distinctions. 1 John 2, 23, anyone who denies the Son doesn't have the Father either, but anyone who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. And he goes on to say your actions, so you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. If you do, you remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. So your behavior proves your faith. 1 John 3, 23 and 24, and this is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. So that's a heart. That's the professing of the faith. And love one another, just as he commanded us. That's the conformity in our behavior. Those who obey God's commandments remain in fellowship with him and he with them. And we know he lives in us because the spirit he gave us lives in us. Thank you, Jesus, for that. 1 John four fifteen: all who declare that Jesus is the son of God, have God living in them, and they live in God. Have you declared Jesus as the Son of God? People who deny Jesus as the Son of God are not a Christian. He is divine. He is God in flesh. Jesus is the true Son of God who came to save us. He lived a perfect life. You know that right now there is a movement in the church, the Christian church, that's trying to say Jesus didn't live perfectly? It's shocking. But are you surprised? Because I'm not surprised anymore. Our world is walking away. Even churches are turning their backs on the Lord. Secondly, we profess faith in Christ, and I've already begun to explain it a little bit. We practice faith faith in Christ. Would you turn to Acts 4, just briefly, just turn a few pages back if you're still in your Bible. Acts 4, 13. Remember when Peter and John were brought before the Sanhedrin and they were, you know, it was terrible what was happening to them. They healed a man. Now they're being questioned and arrested and all that stuff. And Acts 4, 13 says, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. For they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. What a great compliment. See, the church of the uh, community in Antioch, the unbelievers in Antioch, they were complimenting (laughs) these believers. They were complimenting the church saying, you look like that guy Jesus that we've heard so much about. That's a compliment. Thank God for that, right? And how cool is it to be in front of this Jewish council and they say, I can tell this guy's been with Jesus. That's the kind of compliment I want. I can tell that you've been hanging out with Jesus. That's, man, praise the Lord for that. So who we confess is Lord in our lives should be consistent with our living. And I'm going to say something strong here, but I think you're used to me saying strong things, right? Does our life look like service to the Lord or service to self? We really need to make sure we evaluate how we live. 
Is our focus to serve ourselves and do everything we want? Or are we being conformed into the likeness of Christ who served instead of trying to be served? He served, and so we should serve. I don't, I don't just mean like holding a door at church and stuff like that. I mean your whole lifestyle should look like serving God and serving others. Can I get an amen? And so it's not about what you can amass for yourself or what you can get for yourself, but what can you do for God and others? Our lives should look like that. I was uh, planting some new grass seeds in the front yard. We had some power issues and basically a, there was a power um, shortage getting to my home. We don't know what it was yet. We think maybe some, some critters were chewing on wires. I'm pretty sure they're fried, like they're dead, if that's the case. But they had to come in and like dig new lines. And uh, so I saw these, this bare dirt spot and I've been learning when you should plant seeds and I think we had some frost, so that wasn't good. So I guess I started a little too early, maybe, who knows. Hasn't been working too well. But I'm in the front yard and um, the ground is very hard, so I'm breaking it down and just trying to soften it up. I, I water it too. And my neighbor across the street started a conversation with me from his driveway. And he said, do you have like, do you, does your wife have like a girl's Bible study here like every Wednesday or something? Because I see like all these cars pull up and then all these girls come out with like Bibles and stuff like that. Like, is that what's happening? I was like, yeah, she does. She's been doing it for a few years. And, and he said, well, my daughters uh, and I, we read our Bible every night. I was like, oh, praise God, that's awesome. You know, that's great to know, because I didn't know that. Right across the street from me. And he was hinting around whether his daughter, uh, older daughter, could join the group, because Rachel has high schoolers. And so here I'm planning, and by the way, we are inviting them over, just so you know. <laughs> How cool is that, right? So like, I'm planting seeds, like physical seeds, but at the same time, the Holy Spirit is planting seeds. <laughs> Amen? Amen. And you may be like, well, they're already saved, it sounds like. You know, well, yeah, but you know what? We need fellowship as the body of Christ. And we need discipleship. And these girls need to see other girls following Jesus. By the way, ninth graders are teaching the Bible in this small group. How cool is that? My wife didn't teach for almost six weeks because she's been teaching them how to teach the Bible. That's so cool. It's awesome. I've always been intrigued by the quote of Martin Luther and again, I'm on the topic of practicing our faith for all to see. Martin Luther was a reformer, and, and we as Christians, we like to promote our faith through symbols, and, and, and he makes the point that Christians reflect the glory and goodness of God, not so much by symbols, but by what we produce in our lives. And this is what he said. He said, the Christian shoemaker does his duty not by putting little crosses on the shoes, but by making good shoes because God is interested in good craftsmanship. I thought that's pretty profound. I think you can do both and. Make really good shoes and put a little cross on there. You can do both and. But do you get his point? What good is it to put little crosses on shoes and after a month, the shoes fall apart? It would be better to be a quality Christian, in other words. It would be better to represent Christ properly and do our best to represent him than wear a cross and we don't represent him very well. And I got to say something, and I say this in love. Okay, I am getting a little excited, but I'm, I'm not mad. But we need to be careful wearing our Christian shirts and our church shirts and going out in the community and acting a fool. Because that turns people off. And I'll be the first one to say, I've messed up in that department, okay? <laughs> Getting a little frustrated, you know, with the workers and things like that. And I look down, I'm like, I owe you an apology. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. I get it. It happens. But we need to be real careful, amen? We need to be real careful. This past Wednesday, Dr. Melissa Alforo was the speaker for the ordination service, um, we were able to ordain around 28 pastors this past uh, week. Just so you know, in other fellowships, they're struggling to do this. Maybe two or three. And the Assemblies of God, 28. Just in one district, in one moment. Yeah. 
But are you ready for this? We're behind. We have open churches with no pastors. There's no kids pastors coming up. There's a lack of youth pastors. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm, this is a side note. This isn't, well, it, it makes total sense with our scripture. This church was thriving because people stepped up. I just want to let you know that there is a shortage of people being called into ministry, or I believe it's this, they're being called, they're just not listening, or they're not stepping out in faith, or we as the church, or we as people have not believed in them. Sometimes we look at the price tag of what it's going to cost to go to a Christian college or university, and we discourage our children, but the Lord planted a seed in their heart into ministry. We need to be real careful, amen? Amen. And that goes for me too, because I got two kids growing up and I'm like, woo, that's pricey. Lord help me. But there is a lack, but yet we were able to ordain 28. And Dr. Melissa Alfora brought a powerful message. I just want to thank Jesus right now because pastors across the nation are catching the heart of being a disciple-making church and reviving the Great Commission, and that's what she taught. And she said this, she gave an ex- excellent analogy that if she goes and has really good food at a restaurant and gets really good service, she's telling everyone about that restaurant for free. Isn't she right? She's promoting that business for free, and she was alluding to Chick-fil-A. She never said it. She called it God's Chicken or something like that. And greatest, you know, greatest promoter. And you guys have heard me talk about Texas Roadhouse here. I don't know how many times. I don't know why I bring that up all the time. I do like barbecue. But uh, we become those establishments' greatest promoter. And she said, she said this. She challenged us, be God's greatest promoter. Be the gospel's greatest promoter. You've experienced something even greater than good food and good service. You've experienced salvation of your soul. Be God's greatest promoter. Of course, I need to get moving here. The greatest expression of our faith is our love. And what we typically do is we begin with our focus on how we love others, which is awesome. That's great. But that's actually not what Jesus teaches. Jesus actually teaches this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first greatest commandment. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. I just want to encourage us as a church here briefly to make sure we actually follow that order that Jesus gave. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength first. I'm not saying you can't do both at the same time. You obviously can. But God wants to love you in that relationship too. As we love God, and God's already loving us, by the way, because scripture says we love him because he first loved us, amen? Amen. As we live in that relationship, we actually know how to love one another. And this is the greatest expression of our faith. Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So this is a, the greatest expression, but we, here's what we need to be careful of. And this, I'm, I'm hitting this on purpose because our love for God is the other L word, loyalty. And the world looks at us and goes, I thought you weren't supposed to be like that. I thought you weren't supposed to do that. I thought you weren't supposed to talk that way. And they see hypocrisy in us. And so therefore, they don't want to attend church with you or me or whatever. They don't. So we need to make sure we get loving God right. Um, how many know we're not perfect? It's the balance beam effect. We know we're, walk, we're trying to be like Jesus. You know what? Jesus, Jesus was humble. So if we mess up, we humble ourselves. Jesus never messed up, but when we mess up, we can humble ourselves. I didn't get that right. I'm sorry. That says something to the world, that we care about doing things right. Amen? We are meant to love God first and foremost, and we express our love for God by how we love others. And we need to get that right too. Amen? Jesus said in John 15, 9 through 12, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And then he says this. So this is the second part. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. 
But here's the thing. We always focus on the love God, keep his commandments, and then love others, but we miss something. My joy will be complete in you. The world should see a joy coming from us because it's holy joy. It's the joy of the Lord in us. And they should see love. They will all know we are his disciples if we what? If we love one another. So important. 1 Corinthians 13, you've heard it at, at weddings all the time. 1 Corinthians 4 through 8, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. How are we doing on loving one another? If you ever want to know how you're doing, <laughs> ask your family members. <laughs> right? Amen. Spouses, ask your spouse. Ask mama. Ask mom. How am I doing? How can I improve? Moms, how are you doing? How are you doing in that area? You know what we need to do too is we need to be careful we don't beat ourselves up. We're all a work in progress, learning how to love. Listen, the only way we can love the way Christ wants us to love is if we have Christ in us. That's why in John 15, where he, he talks about remaining in him, loving him, so that you can love others as well. It's all about relationship with God. Moms, I want to encourage you with something today. I didn't do a Mother's Day message, but I have a word for you. In Christ, you are enough. And when things get hard and things get tired, you always have Jesus there for you. And I want to encourage you to try not to do this life on your own strength, but do it in the strength of the Lord. Remain in fellowship with Jesus and you'll be able to love and do even more than what you'd thought or imagined through the power of Jesus Christ. And that love that's patient and all these things, that's God's love for you, everyone in this room. He's been very patient with us, hasn't he? <laughs> and he's showing us how to love so we can love others. And there's definitely so many ways that we don't have time today of how we can love people in our community. But let the Lord lead you. Fruit of the Spirit, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, goodness, all those amazing attributes of Jesus is there for you in your life so you can resemble Jesus Christ. Why don't we stand together as we close here. Every once in a while, my wife and I ask each other, how, how are we doing? You know why? Because in the home, you get to see the real person. That's true, isn't it? That's just the sober reality. The real you is at home. But I'm praying the real you is out there in the world too. That we are consistently becoming more and more like Christ. What is a Christian? It's a person that believes in Jesus Christ as his or her Lord and Savior and is doing his best to live like Jesus. That's a basic term, basic definition for you. We're not perfect, but we're doing what we can to represent Jesus. I just wanna encourage you to be a true Christian, to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, amen. Today, if you need to make that decision too, if you need to put your trust in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross for the salvation of your soul, for the forgiveness of your sins, for the gift of eternal life. Isn't it amazing how much Jesus gives us in that one act? Forgiveness of sin, salvation of soul, relationship with God, eternal life with God and all his people, including your, your believing family members. God blesses us so much with faith in him. 
and there's nothing you can do to save yourself. It's all in Jesus Christ, amen? And today, if you need to make that decision, I wanna encourage you to do that. And let's close our eyes and bow our heads. And if you would, if you need to, you can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner in need of saving. And you are Lord and Savior of my life. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Make me a new creation in you. Make me a new person through the power of your Holy Spirit living in me. I give you my life and I give my life to honor and serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you made that decision today, I know that was quick and and brief, but from your heart, that is a genuine moment of conversion. And all of heaven is worshiping and praising, uh, praising God and, and praising and celebrating just one life who gives their life to Jesus Christ. They all celebrate. Isn't that awesome? So let's celebrate together. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, God. We thank you, Lord. Lord, be with us, God. Help us to go out here and represent you to the best of our ability. Thank you, Jesus, for saving us and changing us. Help us to go out and live as your people, as Christ followers, as true Christians. And Lord, we thank you for your mercy and grace helping us along the way. Empower us to be more like you, Lord, and strengthen us to be a light in our community. And Lord, may the church and the, the, those here today feel your love and feel your help. We love you, God, and we give you all the glory and praise. Amen. Amen.